right? So this is why this is why we talk about spaces and not not planes because those planes do not exist. Good morning, happy Tuesday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. And the crazy week continues. Uh, got extended family ruling in as of today, so it's going to get busy around Casa de Hartman. Um, got a regular clinic schedule, so again, very, very busy. So let's dig into today's Q&A. Um, I had a conversation with Jack. And um, Jack did a great job of asking questions in regard to some foundational elements that, um, especially the people that are first being exposed to my model, um, need, to, need to sort of grasp and understand. And um, so we talked about yielding and overcoming actions and how that influences um, behavior during, during walking. We talked about uh, the shape of the skeleton, superficial compressive strategies, how that influences movement outcomes, um, force production in regards to relative uh, movement and, and orientation. Let me see, I got a couple notes here. Um, oh, how ER and IR demonstrate in a split squat. Always interesting to, to talk about those because we have compensatory strategies that we need to be able to identify in the gym. And then um, how context determines whether ER and IR are demonstrated. Some people tend to think it's like an either or thing. And that comes from probably from a dead guy anatomy representation where everybody thinks that there's like this zero point that, that is straight up when the reality is, is that ER and IR always superimposed. Which one is demonstrated is going to be context dependent. So again, really good series of questions from Jack. So Jack, I appreciate you um, very much. If you would like to participate in a 15 minute consultation, um, please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com, put 15 minute consultation in the subject line and we'll arrange that at our mutual convenience. Don't forget that if you're looking for some foundational information in regards to my model, please go to my YouTube channel and subscribe there because there is a bunch of stuff that goes way back a couple years, in fact, and so you can actually see some of the evolution that has taken place in the model itself. Have an outstanding Tuesday. I will see you guys tomorrow. Recording and timer has started. Jack, what is your question? All right. So I understand gait is just a series of alternating turns of the axial skeleton, correct? Generally speaking, yes. I mean, that yes, it's turning, sure. So, and you represent them with uh, phases of propulsion, right? Correct. So just to clarify, so say you have right leg swinging forward. So the sacrum will begin to turn to the left, right? Uh, it depends on where we are, but yeah, that would be the general, the general so principle is that we're gonna turn it that way, yes. It begins turning that way, right? <laughs> As yeah. the right leg swings through. Yeah, so so if I'm if I'm gonna if I'm gonna move the right leg forward, I have to be able to turn the sacrum to the left to, to get that leg out in front of me. Yes. Okay. Okay. So then once you begin to enter stance phase, which is early propulsion as you represent it, right? Correct. That's then that right side will begin to yield. Right, it has to slow. So, so when the foot hits the ground, the leg is no longer moving forward, but everything else is. And so right. I have to slow that side of the axial skeleton down so that I can begin to try to advance the other side. So yes, so, so what, it, what a yield is, is the delay strategy on that side. Got it. And then the left begins an overcoming strategy, right? Yeah, to catch yeah. yeah. Like so I said, all we're doing is... All we're doing is turning yeah. the sacrum from side to side. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's why I kind of view it as like a serious alternating turn. So I see it like yeah. yielding, 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 yielding. And then once that other side catches up, then the other side has to overcome, right? Correct. Okay. So now I'm curious of how... So I understand people become stuck in like these phases of propulsion. They can have the potential to. And so I was wondering how you would test for this to see whether the left or right side is stuck in early or late propulsion. 
Well, it would be represented by, so depending on what environment that you work in. So, so people come to see me, they have painful conditions. And so in many cases, what we do is we'll measure ranges of motion and that determines the, the uh, orientations, then the shape, if you will, of, of the, the body. So that, that's what creates the representations of, of early versus late. And so certain measures will drop off to a more significant degree if somebody's in, in, a, in a late representation of propulsion. So for instance, if somebody is, is, is late on one side, you will tend to see a reduction in early, what would be termed as hip flexion, okay. right? So early hip flexion disappears, straight leg raise is effective, uh, affected. And then um, because of, of the loss of the external rotation measures, I'll experience a loss of internal rotation measures as well. So the later you are in the propulsive phase, the, the less, um, you're going to see in those early phases of, of measurements. Okay. And is that because that posterior side is compressed? It is, it is because yes, the, the, but the reason it's compressed is because you've got a lot of concentric muscle activity in that posterior lower aspect of the, of the pelvis that is basically taking away those spaces where those measures would, would naturally occur. Right. Yeah. Okay. So now what if you have that posterior lower compressive strategy bilaterally? Is that a byproduct of <clears throat> usually a lot of heavy strength training and stuff like that? High well, first? so it, it, it is a learned process. So, so what heavy strength training requires is that you create internal pressure to push upward. So, so if we're using a squat as an example, so what that squat does is it magnifies the downward load on the body. And so if I want to lift it back up, I better be able to squeeze myself harder and harder. The muscles on the outside of the body are the ones that are going to magnify that, that ability to squeeze, create the internal pressure. So I have something that is rigid that I can um, put underneath the load and lift it up, right? So I have to take away ranges of motion. So I'm directing force primarily in one direction, because if I have multiple ranges that are available, that dissipates force. And so that's going to limit how much, how much weight I can lift. So yes, yeah, so strength training will teach you how to do that to whatever degree, right, that, that you allow that influence to predominate. So if, if you're, <clears throat> you know, one of the extremes, so if, if, if the weightlifting portion is part of your sport, like a powerlifter or an Olympic lifter, you're going to see that a whole lot more often um, than if somebody was uh, a baseball player. Although it does show up there too, because they are trained and they do produce forces in the same way. It just might be to a lesser degree. Okay. So that's when those superficial muscle strategies come in is when the need for higher force production, right? Absolutely. Because when yes. you, you can't you can't produce force when you have many body parts that are moving simultaneously because the what what that does is it distributes the force throughout. So again, when especially in sport where we see very forceful activities or high velocity activities that follow this high force production, you'll you'll have these moments in time where the the body segments move as as a single segment, and that's the only way that you can produce force. Yeah. And that's the orientation that you talk about, right? Versus it is. So an orientation is a representation of that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's when people begin to lose relative motion of joints, right? It is absolutely a loss of relative motion because again, you have segments that are moving together. Relative motion is when, is when segments move relative to one another instead of moving together as a single unit. Got it. Okay, so now kind of going back to the gate and phases of propulsion. So I've heard you, I've watched your videos and I've heard you talk about how to set up a split squat to bias ER and IR and, uh -huh. and femur. So I was curious, so could you kind of walk me through like a right foot forward split squat and what you're biasing and what phases of propulsion you're biasing? Okay, it's going to depend on what, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to depend on what the goal is because we can manip manipulate the positions. Okay. All right, generally speaking, excuse me, <clears throat> 
generally speaking at the top of the split squat and depending on loads and things like that. So, so let's take load out of the equation because load is going to immediately restrict relative motions. So we're just talking about somebody that has a fair level of force production. And so body weight's not the strongest of influences, right? And we're just gonna run them through a split squat. Your, your ER representation is going to be uh, demonstrated at, at the top of the split squat. So I've got one leg in front, I've got one leg back. Generally speaking, that's going to be a bias towards external rotation. Now, both feet are on the ground, so there is an element of internal rotation already superimposed. How you do that is going to depend on who you are and then what kind of a strategy you bring to the table. But, but generally speaking, generally speaking, the bias at the top of the split squat is going to be external rotation. I can make, I can make that lead leg um, a, a, a late representation by, by orientation, or I can bias it towards early by creating a delay strategy on that front side. And there's any number of ways to do that from, from simply turning the sacrum towards the lead leg, or I can unweight it and turn the sacrum towards the lead leg. So again, I can create any bias that you want from there. As you descend into the split squat, generally speaking, you're going to move towards internal rotation if you have the capabilities to do so, right? So, so again, grossly speaking, ER at the top, IR at the bottom, but now we have to talk about how did you want to bias the activity to achieve whatever intention you had, and then who are we talking about and what strategies do they have? Do they even have the capability to capture the internal rotation at the bottom? And if not, then we're going to see some form of compensatory strategy. So these are the people that you see with the uneven pelvises, or you see the knee deviate away from midline and things like that, because they're trying to do this thing. In, in an ER representation rather than IR representation, which means that they have to create a space of ER, then they superimpose some kind of an IR strategy on top of it, knowing full well that IR is down, ER is up. Okay. So when, so there's that moment of IR that you have to create during the split squat to push yes. back up, right? Yes, sir, absolutely. So during that moment, does that affect the strategy on the posterior side, like the uh, yielding or overcoming strategy on that posterior side? It, it may, it may. And again, it, it's like we, w one, we have to have, we have to have an observation of sorts. We have to say, okay, this is what you, this is what you did under those circumstances. And so this is, this is the strategy that you used. Okay. And so each one of those has a representation that we would identify. And again, in the gym, we can do we can do this visually to a degree. We don't have to throw people on the table to identify these things. We just have to understand what's going on. Okay. Uh, all right, I'm gonna kind of move to the upper body a little bit. Uh, okay. You have four minutes. Okay. Just, then, just well, to plan accordingly. All right. So. I've heard you talk about how end range shoulder flexion is a measure of dorsal rostral expansion, right? Okay, it's that's going to be context dependent. That's okay. That's what I figured because I've. So, I'm. Can I finish my question quick? Absolutely. So you have the. I've heard you mention it's a component of dorsal dorsal rostral expansion, and then I've also heard you utilizing it as a technique of compression, dorsal rostral compression on that side. So right. like using it as an element of compression to expand the other side. So I'm kind of curious of, yeah, in what context is. Okay, so if I'm looking just at, at acquisition of, of motion, so to acquire the space. So here's the problem is that is that flexion is associated with an imaginary sagittal plane that does not exist. The space that you put the arm overhead does exist, okay? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to access that space, right? Depending on load strategies, depending on what the axial skeleton is capable of doing, so, so again, my physical structure determines how I'm going to get my arm into that space. 
And so under certain circumstances, so if a higher force production is required, so if I put a heavy kettlebell in your hand and I say, put it in that space, I got news for you. It ain't gonna be external rotation because I need force production, which is IR. And so you're gonna have an IR strategy to create that, which means you're gonna get dorsal rostral compression, but I can assure you with great confidence that is not going to be the same representation that if you were laying on a treatment table and we were trying to measure shoulder flexion, which would require dorsal rostral expansion and an ER representation to, to capture that space, they are two totally different animals, right? So this is why, this is why we talk about spaces and not, not planes because those planes do not exist. Those planes exist for us to have a conversation to talk about points in space and that's it. It's not how we move. We don't move in, we don't ever move in straight planes. So, so I'm an undergrad in exercise science. So sorry to hear that. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's your foundation. Always remember that it's a foundation that you build upon. It's an analogy for you to make comparisons with. So, so there's value there. There's value, but just understand that there's more than one filter. For sure. But yeah, I found your videos and after finding them, I kind of lost all motivation. To, but <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not what I'm trying to do. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're guiding me in a better perspective of this kind of stuff. And so, uh, well, better is better is your judgment. Um, it, I, I'm just hoping to be useful. Yeah, you know, no, but um, yeah. It's, do I have any more time? Or yeah, you have you have a minute and four seconds, three seconds, two seconds. Go, go, Jack, go about a flat thoracic spine and a narrow versus a wide say again flat flat thoracic spine and a narrow versus a wide uh-huh uh can you tell me a little bit about that or how it come about so so if you're gonna say flat let's just say that we've got dorsal rostral compression is that fair yeah. Yeah. okay doesn't matter which archetype you're talking about, the dorsal rostral compression occurs for the same reason because it is superficial strategy. So it is, it is outside the, the, the direct representation of either archetype. So both have superficial musculature, both will use it for the same, for the same reason. It just might happen at a different time because of the sequencing that, that is associated with the, uh, with the archetypes themselves. So, so they have very specific strategies that are associated with their structures. Because if we, if we looked at the two extremes, like the extreme wide and the extreme narrow, they hold their position in space by, by two different strategies. So you've heard me probably, if you've seen my videos, you know that I talk about two strategies in one plane, right? So the strategy is expansion or compression. And, but for us to maintain our position, eventually everybody will move towards compressing to hold position in space, right? Especially at the extremes, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make, re remain upright on two legs against gravity. And everybody thinks that's an easy thing because you've been walking around since you were one year old, but the reality is, is it's, a, it's a continuous circus act. It is very, very difficult. So difficult that we are the only animals on earth that do it to any reasonable degree um, of, of success. Um, so again, it doesn't really matter which archetype you're talking about. What I would, what I would do is I would go back. There's a couple of videos where I talk about the, the progression of the superficial strategies. And so what you probably want to do there <clears throat> is just distinguish as to when that representation would be demonstrated, um, based on the two archetypes. Cool. Oh, you cut out on me, Jack. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? There we go. I tell you what, brother, we are out of time, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yep. Okay. I appreciate you. No. All right. You have a great day. Yeah, you too. All right. We'll see you.